effort to stay on time and give you guys the length of time for the panel, I'll go ahead and introduce. My name is Jane Schellenbarger. I'm on the board of ANSICA, and it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Tony Marsh, who is a professor of ceramics at Long Beach, uh, Cal State Long Beach. I knew I was going to mess that up and has been uh, one of my uh, ceramic idols for many years, and I love his work, and um, I was so, so fortunate to get to work with him a little bit this year um, with Ansika's Emerging Artist Group. Anyway, um, without further ado, uh, please welcome Tony Marsh. Thank you, Jane. So it's such a pleasure to be here, and um, uh, this panel discussion is titled Transcultural Hybrid, Authenticity and Adaptation. And then I add Korean style to that because um, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're, we're dealing with um, four Korean artists here today and with, this, with the topic of this panel. And I, I would like to say that um, I'm a 23rd hour fill-in for the moderator. And so, um, but I'm very happy to be here because I know almost everyone on the panel very well. Um, and I know the sacrifices that they've made to come to this country and work, and um, how hard they've worked, and what they've had to navigate culturally in order to be successful, um, as they have been. Each of them is very different, and um, has a very compelling story to tell, and is on, I think, you know, each of them distinctly different and interesting artistic journey in life. So um, they're all teachers as well, or have been teachers uh, on the university level, um, as well as being uh, functioning artists. So with that, what I'd like to do is to introduce them, and, um, and then I'm going to ask them some questions, um, and we'll engage the whole group. And, and as we pass through that, then I'd like to open it up to the audience and uh, to have you ask questions. And so I'd first like to start with, on to my far right, is uh, Sung Gu Ya, and then Myung Jin Kim, and on this side is Jae Wan Lee, and Hoon Lee, okay? So I'm gonna start and uh, talk a little bit about each of them and their work. <coughs> And um, so you get to know them a little bit, um, but unfortunately, it's brief. I, I, I probably could talk about any of them for an hour, to be honest. So uh, Sung Gu Ya um, was at Long Beach State as a, as a post-bac student in the mid-1990s. And he went on to receive his MFA from Alfred University in New York in 97. And he's currently a professor of art at the University of Georgia, Athens. He's exhibited his ceramic sculpture all over the world and won numerous awards, including the grand prize at the second World Ceramic Biennale International Comp Competition at Ichon in Korea. <coughs> and for, for my money, that is the biggest, most ambitious, most prestigious, prominent um, competition, exhibition for ceramic art, internationally speaking, in the world. So qu quite an honor, really. Um, his work is housed in many important museum and permanent collections around the world. And if you have to talk about Sungu's work in a short discussion, it's hard to know where to start. But I think what I'd like to focus on for him is his most recent significant accomplishment, which was a residency, a new body of work, and a retrospective exhibition at the Gimhae Clay Arts Museum in 2013, and that's down in Busan, uh, South Korea. It was the summing up of 25 years of artistic accomplishment, <coughs> and I happened to be at that opening, and uh, it was remarkable, truly remarkable. And this is a picture of Sungu um, that I really love because it says a lot, you know. You can see him embedded in his work, and. Um, that's the way it is with Sungu. He's one of the hardest working artists I've ever met. And prolific work pours out of him, two-dimensional work, three-dimensional work. And so a really beautiful picture there. This is a picture of, of work in progress at the residency with Sungu. Um, you know, it's almost a Where's Waldo. If you can find Sungu in there, you'll, you'll understand the scale of his work. 
And um, uh, this is all work in progress at, down in Kim, in Kim Hay Clay Arch Museum. Um, Sungu grew up in a Christian household in Korea. And um, he also, um, if, you, if you grow up in Christian culture, you're, you have to deal with Confucianism, which um, is a high, a high degree of social order that um, helps uh, guide Koreans and, and how to live a productive life. Um, but there's also Taoism and shamanism and, uh, and Christianity. And so Sungu knows all, knows all those things and has had to navigate all those things. And so he understands complexity. And I feel like that is the hallmark of his work in a way. And his art is a map that guides us through the sentiments and symbols of all of these belief systems. He's been in the US now for over 25 years and in that time has learned as all of these people at the table with me tonight um, have been, to graft what they need from each of the cultures uh, and integrate that into an artistic expression. Sungu moves very fluidly between the vivid differences in language, history, values, and assumptions. Two very powerful cultures. And for Sungu, and again, with all the artists at the table tonight, it's an east-west split. Sungu's work, um, here's more work in progress. Uh, it broadcasts multiple messages to be interpreted by the viewer. In one work alone, we can find moments of beauty and horror, tenderness, humor, and the absolute absurd. His figurative sculpture, and I think this is an important point, is not made up of portraits of known individuals. Rather, it's a composition or a compendium of an assortment of pan-cultural archetypes. I think that's very important. I feel like in looking at his work over the years, I see myself in it, and I'm very proud that uh, I, I recognize that I think Sungo's made a portrait of me, but it's not, you know, it's, it's an archetype, and I think that's, that allows entrance for anybody um, into the work. I can't read it. I have a little technical problem up here, but There's a little technical problem if someone could help me. Is Tony there? I don't think you can scroll. Yeah. Give me just a second. Excuse me. My my text is uh, is lost. I can't scroll. Yeah. So I think that in Sungu's work. Um, he creates natural dramas that come from the banal and the grand themes in life, and they, they speak to our own experiences. And uh, if I go back, that is a picture of Sungu with a work in progress, again, to give you a scale. And uh, as I mentioned, I think Sungu is really one of the most uh, artistically ambitious artists that I know I've ever met. This is the same piece finished. and. Uh, <coughs> in the exhibition at Kim Hay. And I don't even have time really to talk about how masterful he is almost as a painter with, with uh, glazes at Cone 10, you know. Uh, he may use 40 or 50 glazes on, one, on a single piece, one shot, glaze it and fire it. Um, there's, there's a lot to say about his work, but. Um, I think one thing I'd like to try to do, this is a, a, an image of the Grand Hall in the exhibition space at Gim Hay, and he, he occupied two full floors of that building. So it was a remarkable kind of a retrospective of 25 years of work. Um, but if you look at these totem pieces, you can get a sense of how big they are. They're enormous. And um, what I'd like to do now is take a deep breath and uh, give you an incomplete inventory of just several of the works pictured here. And it would include the following characters and objects, a duck, a tiger, human skulls, demons, saints, mythological sea creatures, assorted good and bad men and women, a howling dog, a monkey, flowers and bud and blossom, a priest, a king, a fighter, and more. 
All are characters from across different cultural and religious histories, East and West. Histories that express multiple states of our collective humanity. Let me continue. The mythological guardian animals, mothers, children, fathers, aunties, uncles, strange birds, assorted domestic farm and wild animals, and it goes on and on. That's Sungu's work, and it's, you'd be better off trying to compile a list of things that do not show up in his work. And in a way, for me, it's a, he's one of those artists that is, goes about the business in, a, in his life's work of recreating the whole world in his own, in his own image. These are a few large porcelain panels that he made in China. And for me, he had the opportunity to go there and uh, workshop and, uh, and work on, when I say large, those are probably about six feet um, tall. And so together, this, uh, you know, create a mural on the wall. And they are of his cast of characters. But what I like about it as well is this is a nod, you know, to the great blue and white Asian traditions and cobalt painted ceramics. And as I mentioned, I could go on with Sungu, but I'm going to move on to Jay Wan Lee, who sits on my left. Jay Wan was born in Seoul and sent to the United States by her parents to complete her university education. She graduated from CSULB, where I teach, in 1991 with a bachelor's degree or a BFA in, I think, sculpture at the time, and uh, then went on to Alfred University in 1995 and earned her Master of Fine Arts degree. And I think that made her perhaps the second Korean woman to uh, be accepted and completed a master's degree at Alfred. And so kind of uh, the, first, the first woman uh, was there in the 60s, I believe. So it was a new generation and uh, kind of groundbreaking, really, and started to open the doors at Alfred uh, for Korean artists to come there. Um, Ms. Lee is a professor of art at Michigan State University and has lived and worked in America for over 20 years. And Jay Wan has used, over time, an, ass an assorted, um, ass assorted art making materials and different artistic strategies in creating her, uh, her art throughout her career. I'd like to take a moment here though, however, just to introduce you to her work in ceramics if you don't know it. The work she creates is a quiet and thoughtful reflection, if not meditation, and response to her experience in living between two cultures. She told me once that she no longer feels at home in either culture. Some of her earliest ceramic art were these minimalistic, intimate, simple, geometric forms with color and pattern. While this work appears to be simple, and I just called it simple, it's not. Um, I think it's encoded with a very clear, kind of Confucianist aesthetic message about the power of direct, pure simplicity it additionally refers to Goryeo Dynasty inlaid porcelains, if you're familiar with that. And it also calls to, uh, it, it calls to childhood memories for uh, Jae Wan of her grandmother and having watched her embroider patterns. You see those, the patterns there. Um, as if that were not enough, the shapes perhaps in their simplicity were reinforced by what we called new minimalist sculpture that was being made on the West Coast in Southern California, why Jay Wan was studying there. And I, I remember talking, we'd talk about the, the, the artists who were functioning then, and I'm sure that um, that was influential in the development of her work as well. Jay Wan's ability to imagine, interpret, and graft all this together in a poetic ceramic moment, for me and many people, is sublime. I believe the title of this piece is called Floating Mountains, and it's a homage to the great Asian traditions in landscape painting and blue and white painted porcelain. In this work, again, I mentioned this, but in this work are embedded the Confucian ideals of hard work, perseverance, homage, and sacrifice to a cause greater than oneself, and that's the only way work like this can be made. This work in particular, um, while for, for American eyes is outwardly modest, um, it also pays homage to the great Joseon Dynasty porcelains. And um, Jae Wan here uses the language of ceramic color as cultural identity. If you're Korean, you understand these colors in a very specific way. They carry meaning. I know that increasingly in her art, she's been searching for the meaning of the many values of white, 
perhaps to no other culture is white as symbolically important a color or non-color and an idea as to the Korean people moving forward from the Chosun dynasty with the introduction of Confucianist thought. Maybe the Eskimos, I don't know. White's important to them too, <laughs> as a color. <coughs> but it is, it's, it's a very serious color in Korea. Um, okay, I'm, I'm gonna move on um, to Hoon Lee. And Hoon, I don't, I've not known that well, but I've, I, it's been such a joy to get to know him and talk to him about his work. Um, he is a professor and ceramics program coordinator at Grand Valley State University in Michigan. He earned his master's degree, his master's in ceramic art and industrial design from Seoul National University of Technology and an MFA from Alfred University in 2001. As a student in Korea, Hoon was on a bit of an artistic island in the early 1990s. While he's very much aware of Korea's deep history and contributions to the field of ceramics and in possession of most of the skill sets that object makers need, his interests were moving away, as a student, his interests were moving away from historical models and or traditional models for working with clay and towards a more contemporary fine art practice of process works, installation, and performance art. And that made him very different than his contemporaries in Korea at the time in the field of ceramics. Um, you know, uh, rather alone probably. Despite the background in studio ceramics, Lee mostly works as a performative installation artist and exhibits his work internationally. He's participated in over 20 solo exhibitions uh, and residencies around the world. So with his work, um, the image on the screen now is an image from his master's thesis exhibition um, at Seoul National Technical Institute. And ceramic materials and the history of ceramic art has become and became at the time and remains to this day the subject of his work and not always the object. Um, his master's thesis exhibition, which you see here, was an early process-oriented work with the gallery as a stage where unfired clay was dried, rehydrated, and symbolically and to some degree realistically fired in the gallery and then broken. And perhaps you might say that something like this was a conceptual examination of the material life cycle of a ceramic object. In 97, Kuhn was invited to participate in an international workshop in Tokoname, Japan, which is one of the great, the six great kiln sites in Japan. And um, I'm so glad that uh, he was able to find this image of this piece. I think it's an important piece for him. He was the only Korean artist um, who was invited to this international workshop. And, um, and he decided, for whatever reason, to bring with him part of his own artistic cultural heritage. And so he brought shards that he had collected from the Goryeo and Chosun dynasties um, in Korea and brought that with him. And in a poetic gesture, he commingled those shards on top of this shard, a contemporary shard tile at a tile factory where the workshop was being held and felt about it as though it were a happening. The audience was small, but there was an audience. And, um, and so in thinking back on it, he considers this to be his first performance work, which set the stage for others to come. Hoon was accepted to the MFA in ceramics at uh, Alfred University and continued to evolve artistically, uh, although still kind of on an island a bit. Um, his thesis exhibit there evolved to include performance. And um, we're, we're told that it was the, prefers, the first kind of performative installation work that was presented at MF for an MFA degree, presented for a thesis. Um, at Alfred University, and so it was a little perplexing to the teachers too, and they had to, they had to contend with that and deal with it um, in, in, in the context of the history of their program. So <coughs> he, was, he continues to kind of um, you know, blaze uh, a trail where he's opening doors, where he goes to school. Um, I decided to quote, uh, the title of that was Murmur, Murder, and Mother, and I'm quoting Professor Linda Sikora, who was part of his thesis committee. And she wrote this about the work. Black floors covered with liquid porcelain, white milk, black ink, 
rhythmic and repetitive activity, reductive and astutely aesthetic, Hoon Lee's performances and performa performative installations are objects and events. Working with performance-based installations for the past few years, Hoon has negotiated his proximity to the work by placing himself as audience, by employing scripted models in the pieces, and by performing in the pieces proper. Milk, mother, washing, sewing. Woman is present as patriarchal stereotype in the work. In much of Hoon Lee's work to date, it's perhaps best summed up or understood as a meditation on his own mother, his homeland, Korea, and Mother Earth. He stated to me in a, dis in a brief discussion that he was not, he's been asked about it, he's not a feminist artist, but rather a maternalist, and I like that. Okay, so the last panelist I'm gonna talk about today before we open it up to questions, before I open it up to questions with them and then you, um, is Myung Jin Kim, sitting, sitting to my right. She received her MFA at Seoul National University in 2002, and since her arrival in the States over 15 years ago, she has taught ceramics for Sungu at uh, UGA and also for UGA in Cortona, Italy, their study abroad program, and she's also additionally taught for us at Long Beach State. Myung Jin has participated in over 50 curated and juried exhibitions in the United States, Europe, and Asia. Her ceramic art is in many prominent private collections around the United States. MJ is currently a two-year resident artist at the Archie Bray Foundation, and although an object maker, her ceramic art is not that easily pigeonholed. This is quoting MJ. I am at the same time fascinated and gratified that when I work with clay, I can paint, draw, and sculpt on many different levels in the same work. And in a sense, Myung Jin is a storyteller who in the same body of work might create tableaus that direct one's attention to an imaginary utopic world or create an assortment of vessels that put their contents on display, borrowing from surrealism. Here the artist says these particular pair of jars and a few others that she made at the time were about unrealized desire. I think that Myung Jin's interest in creating the illusion of one kind of space while creating the physical reality of another has been one of the primary strengths in her work. Her ceramic art is a frequent intersection of subject matters and objects from both the worlds of nature and culture. She says, I travel as often as possible and I'm inspired by the art of other cultures, in particular still life paintings from Northern Europe. I enjoy their level of realism and try to learn from, from them about their powerful sense of symbolism and narrative to tell parts of the story of human life in a compelling way. Her work engages base human experiences like vanity, vulnerability, fate, and greed. I don't know if you can read the text on those bricks, but it's kind of funny. Quoting the artist again, I've traveled to France, Italy, and Spain regularly to look at art and have been fascinated by how the body has been fragmented for ritual and religious superstition. I wanted to respond artistically and started with these overscaled hands because the hand is irresistible, irresistibly beautiful and expressive. In this work, and this is a fairly relatively recent work, um, MJ is painting empathetic portraits on porcelain picture frames inspired by historical images in painting and photography from around the world. They represent the extreme edges of expression, if you can see them, happy and joyous, sad or horrified. Each <coughs> of the candles has been melted to different heights suggesting of the slippage of time. Each of the portraits gazes back at the viewer through a field of candles, and at the heart of this project is the idea that although each of us is human, we're quite capable of experiencing even the smallest of events, such as the burning of a candle, with the widest variety of understanding and reaction. It is part of the mystery of cultural conditioning and of just being human. So if you would please give my panel a hand. Okay, 
So thank you. And <clears throat> I, the first question I'd like to ask, and this is just a question I'm going to ask to the panel, and then um, we'll see who jumps in, and I'll try to moderate, right? Um, how do you synthesize the historical art influences in Korea, the East, with the contemporary art influences in America, the West? Would anyone like to take that? Sungu, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna pick <laughs> Sungu. <Yeah. laughs> we, we were in a really casual uh, the first time, but you made me, you know, very serious, you know, <laughs> to <serious>. cover. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I can think about it, you know, when I think about, you know, East and West, maybe. Uh, some, you know, vocabulary pops up, maybe. And I lived here 28 years, and I lived in Korea 28 years, so I'm kind of, you know, culturally uh, screwed, you know, half and half here. And I, when I think about that, you know, the East, always there's a tradition I can think about that. And uh, in West, this is probably contemporary, you know, I can think about. And when I think about East, there's a craft. And West, sometimes, you know, I think about fine art. And uh, when I think about the East, sometimes idea and the West, you know, act. And sometimes, you know, East, uh, to me is a burden or a baggage and West you know sometimes I think about freedom you know those two issues you know I've been carried on uh, I, I didn't know what to do when I was here first time and those two issues you know always uh, I questioned to myself you know I didn't know uh, I never thought about myself as an artist you know and I had a passionate things. I want to be a baseball player when I was in Korea. And yeah, and I love that game. And uh, I, I thought, you know, I'm really passionate about the game. But uh, I couldn't make that happen when I was, you know, really young age. I was not really serious even. But uh, uh, I assume and I guess, you know, maybe living as an artist probably the way uh, so from the beginning, to become an artist or even students, you know, always that's the questions, you know. Uh, do you have enough uh, talent to be a good artist? Uh, or, you know, you are in the right track? You know? And uh, the questions, you know, what uh, you really want to make as an artist, that was the questions. And I have to answer that. You know, or prove to myself, you know, I'm still going on. So that's the two things, I mean, you know, I carried on when I think about the East and West, I think, influence. Anybody? Well, my case, actually, Sungu said 50, 50, 28 years, 28 years, like this. I lived in Korea more than I lived in the U.S., so I guess I'm still synthesizing. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really say 28, 28? You're not that old. But somehow it's said. You know, I, I don't know. I, 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 yeah, I, I but know. the math. Yeah, 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 yeah so my math is really bad. I okay. <laughs> yeah. But my case actually is, I'm talking about actually more, I think he said that something about history and then some other things, but my case is about, you know, is uh, Korea especially case is about my aesthetics, you know, aesthetic choice I made. You know, yeah. That's how I grew up, I learned what I saw, what I ate even. But here when I moved to the U.S., you know, I guess I'm thinking about more conceptual stuff. So, and then Korea case, I'm thinking about more about my origin or ideas, and also the process of actually making things. You know, that's how I study <laughs> ceramics you know, as undergrad level students. But since I moved to the US, I'm thinking about more materials and concepts here, especially in output case, because well, I, we talked about that actually during lunchtime. You know, it's like even though you learn about all the clays and then glazing, you know, those kind of things, clay calculation, all those kind of classes in Korea. But actually, I never made clay body before in Korea. The first time I learned how to make my own clay body was at Alfred. You know, so, so that's why I say a little more about my ideas and process based on my Korean aesthetics and histories. And then materials and the concepts is more about here in the US. That's my case. Uh, I may um, talk more 
about uh, my personal journey as an artist moving. Well, all these three artists came to the States as they wanted. So my approach was different. I was sent without my agreement. My father decided to send children to the States for better education to avoid um, political conflict in, in Korea back then. So all of us sacrificed quite a lot. And I saw myself as a transplanted um, plant. I love lilies of the valley and forget-me-nots, mild sweetest small flowers that just um, grow unnoticed in the shaded area. So I was so feeble, small flower, but beautiful when you look at it, when you take time to look really into it. And now that's myself, that's the past, that's historical entity who's replanted in here. So sense of uh, displacement, loss, was really huge on top of language barrier and culture shock. And the current or um, contemporary influence would be a different soil, different kinds of nutrients and climate. Too much sun. I, I went to LA first. Too much sun. So I, I moved to Michigan. What was I thinking? I want the sun back. We have a lot of Michiganians here up front. So now these new challenges suffocate me, you know, wither me, but I had that uh, maybe Korean spirit. I have to survive. You know, Korea is going through so much politically right now. You know, if you pay attention, we're in <laughs> a big uh, chaotic state. But I had to survive and finding art was kind of a nutrient. I could, uh, I could express myself. So I chose visual language. I was studying psychology in Korea and I found art. I don't know if I didn't find art, what <laughs> have I become this day? And that visual um, language was more important than verbal expression. And teachers, I, I like embarrassing people. And Tony was my uh, teacher as he introduced. This is a very Western, very dynamic uh, challenge he or other great teachers, I'm very fortunate to have great teachers, challenge us. So why? Why do you make these things? But in Korea, how is more important? How you make certain things? So a lot of um, our students come to the States with great uh, skill set, techniques. They can draw so masterfully. But why do you do it? Then we had to really think and then, you know, verbalize it, elaborate our thoughts. So having or lacking that kind of a creative mind was another challenge on top of the language uh, uh, barrier. So, you know, synthesizing both my past, the East, and then new challenge of the West. In, in some way, I think it's been a blessing. Also, it's a curse, of course. Being an artist is also double-edged sword. We're blessed, but we're cursed. So I'm still synthesizing. I lived here longer than Hun Lee, but I'm still synthesizing. I complain a lot. My colleague, Paul Kutula and uh, Blake Williams know I complain, but I, I count my blessings. <laughs> <laughs> My background, um, my educational background wasn't happening here, so I think um, I still value certain things that uh, I learned highly, like uh, my study in Korea was based on the craft, and so I wasn't really interested in contemporary art, uh, even though I started like uh, watching them more in America, so, and also that I moved to America, that I didn't come here to study ceramics or being an artist here at all, and I just found out that uh, I have chance or opportunities that I can make a living here. And so the thing I uh, get was more freedom to start, but certain things uh, to make a narratives in my work, all the values are from uh, Korea, and I still value certain materials or visual influences uh, back from Korean uh, folk art paintings and all those techniques 
uh, was birthed, uh, I learned in Korea, but um, here uh, I'm kind of open to, I think, my, o my own way. I have trouble too. Yeah, I mean like, I get more influence from uh, Western um, European uh, still life and I still, <laughs> Uh, yeah, as you know, that all these Koreans have big influence from Confucianism that, as you said, I talk about life stories or relationship, a lot of things. I'm not going to go to the human bodies or somehow it uh, deter me to go directly to human form, not like Sanggu. I still go more like uh, feminism-like or more like domestic uh, subjects. I kind of talk that way uh, indirectly. That's my experience here. Okay, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Um, I have another question here. And um, this might be the last question if I'm gonna save some time for the audience, okay. Um, in what ways did your, well, maybe I won't ask this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, because we kind of just answered part of it. Let me see. I don't want to be too repetitive here. Um, I. You know, something that I am very interested in is Confucianism, the particular Korean brand of Confucianism. Just so you know, uh, it's not a religion. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a highly structured social order that, that helps the culture move forward, and helps the society be a civil society that, that functions. And, and, and so in Korea, they have their, they've evolved their own brand of Confucianism. It's very strong, and to be Korean is, is to own Confucianism, whether you know it or not or like it or not. Um, so I'm very interested in that. It's a very powerful influence, and uh, it's affected all four artists here. And so my, my question is, I'd like them to talk about that a little bit, if they can, and how do you understand the influence of Confucianism in your art and, and, and in your teaching? You know, perhaps how has that influenced you as a teacher? Should I start with Sungu again? Or how about Hun this time? Well, to be honest, actually, <laughs> I, I don't think about that a lot. So it's pretty difficult actually how to compare things because I'm a Korean no matter what, you know. So it's, so I try not try not to kind of a, I don't know whether even a right word comparing it, you know. It's like I'm an apple and then I'm gonna compare with you, your orange, you know. You have to be a third one. So if not, it's gonna be pretty subjective about it, you know. How can you compare it, you know? So I try not to actually juxtaposing those kind of a two things. Try not to maybe, you know, but because either or, I'm on that side. Look at me, you know. So I made a joke about that actually maybe in California. It's like I'm not I'm not banana enough <laughs> at this point. <laughs> so but I don't know, that's my thought at this point, you know. So so but I'd rather actually, you know, just I don't know, just ign uh, uh, the, I don't know, just try to understand like where I am at the same time and then try instead of comparing and juxtaposing those things like how can I actually merge those things together? And also how can I diverge those things together at the same time, you know? That's what I'm actually rather focusing on or try to be that way you know, rather than just comparing it. But at the same time, you know, confusion, well, it's almost impossible to think about it without that because, you know, born in Korea, living in Korea, you know, it's in us, you know, it's all of us, you know, in some way and somehow. So whatever I do, however I think about things, but it's still the basis about that is my family, my culture, the social structure even gender roles, you know, especially in my work case, about the gender role is a pretty big thing, confusion in gender roles, especially about female roles and mothers, you know. I never even thought about that when I was in Korea. I'm the first son of the first son of the first son we talked about. But I didn't realize, you know, how much actually my mother has to put, you know, her entire life into that family because the only one reason, she was married to my father, period. And then pretty much, you know, she disappeared, you know, just she exists as a wife, mother. But I didn't realize this until, like, since I moved to the U.S. and then I realized that more and more. It's like, and then going back, you know, try to pay back to my mother, I guess. Well, she's a Christian, you know, but it's, so that's why I call that as kind of like a penance to my mother. Mm -hmm. So all the performance pieces I did was exactly try to mimic that or copy it or just try to do like what my mother did to me. That's the washing is coming from or cleaning is coming from. And then even the title of my piece, you know, I, I used that title for about past 10 years, 
that murmur, murder, and mother. You know? So M is the first sound that a human being makes first time. You know? Ma. You know? So that's why I call my mother. So um, ma is the same thing in Korea. You know? So if I didn't move to the US, then I don't think I could have done that. You know? I don't think that's coming out from comparing it. You know? Either it's temporal distance or spatial distance. Because of that, I can actually look back where am I, and where is my mother? You know, I felt that more, but at the same time, I'm still Confucianist, st Confucianist at the same time, because my mom never been to my show ever. She doesn't know what I'm doing. Never invited her. You know, pretty much I'm staying there. It's a typical Korean guy thing. Mom, it's okay, you know, I'll take, I can take care of it. Don't worry about it, I'm doing fine, you know. I eat it enough, uh, I'm healthy enough. You're good, you know, so. Yeah, so like, I don't know. So I'm in kind of in a dilemma in between, you know. So that's my at this point and personally, you know. I think my yeah. I, I can I can talk about it. Uh, the Korean loves, you know, uh, religion. I think you know, Korea people love religion, especially you know that uh, Confucianism is embedded in their kind of you know moral code. I think. So, but you know, the important things about uh, Confucianism is probably relationship, and about the relationship with your, you know, king and relationship with your, you know, teacher, and relationship between man and wife, and relationship between, you know, son and or you know, father and parents, you know, something like that. Um, my work's about that. I mean, I'm, I, I, I start to thinking about, as I mentioned before, you know, my work starts, you know, who am I, and then what's my role as an artist. So those kind of relationships, different kind of relationships, sometimes vertical, sometimes kind of horizontal, you know, all kind of role or relationship what I have is very important, you know, to me. And, uh, you know, in my work about uh, relationship, about the Confucianism, you know, that moral code is about it. And I often, you know, talk uh, first, you know, class uh, to my students, you know, emphasize those relationships, you know. What we having is this uh, new, you know, start and new relationships. So I wish, you know, I can build up, or, you know, students also can build up the relationship with me, with the, you know, really good uh, positive you know attitude if they have a, you know those kind of good attitudes you know what ever their you know uh, occupation is going to be but uh, it's going to be a you know really valuable asset for them for their life i think that's what i believe so uh, i i more and more you know uh, when i'm as an artist or you know as an educator i'm thinking about those you know the relationship from the Confucianism, I think that's pretty important to me. And I always, you know, emphasize or stress, you know, to my students, I wish, you know, we can build a really good relationship. I, um, Jay Wan, I'm in talking about her work briefly here. I made two references in two separate pieces to Confucius aesthetics and ideals. And, and maybe you'd like to address that a little bit, maybe if I read the work correctly or not. Uh, it's quite interesting to hear Ya's comment on his uh, interpretation on um, Confucianism. The Gongzi, he is this uh, brilliant scholar and philosopher and teacher in China many, many centuries ago. And his followers actually took his teachings as a philosophical sanction called Confucianism. And Confucianism, I think, is uh, studied more in the West and I became a feminist after I came to the States because seeing these American women so powerful, full of energy, although they changed their last name, <laughs> follow their you know, husband's name, that was really bizarre. But, and I wasn't, we, the girls especially, we were raised to be seen, not to be heard. Obey, you listen, obey, good girl. I was such a good girl. I'm a bad girl now. <laughs> but Confucius, what we say in general, Confucianism, it's more of a societal, um, ethical structure. To me, it's very hierarchical. You know, king rules his subject. Subjects 
praise him, obey him. And teachers are above students. And husbands are the head in the um, family. Women, you do all the work. You know, he's repenting here. Kun is repenting and thinking of his mother. And you're quiet. You're not visible. But why? They don't change. They don't follow their husband's name. Maybe Korea was feminist. <laughs> Not Confucius, but no. Women don't even deserve to carry a husband's uh, family name. Wow. Yeah, that's what I learned. And I, I got angrier. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't like it. And here, you know, I have some students, and I treat them equal. I don't think they would agree. I'm not above you. I work for you, with you. And I always say, I want to learn something from you. You're not under me. you got to teach me something if you want the 4.0, the highest uh, grade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rebecca has te uh, taught me so much, too. So. I was uh, against these uh, hierarchies in human um, relationship, social structure, and um, filial obligation. My mother had to be so guilty because another girl, after all that pain and toil, I was born into this world. She was so guilty. And his mother, my uh, grandmother, I spent a lot of time. I learned uh, embroidery, stitch work, needlework from her. That's how I became an inlay work with the needles later on. And she was guiltier. Oh, God, what if my daughter is kicked out of this family? You know, family linkage, then it's so important. So that's how I um, learned about uh, Confucius' uh, social structure. Uh, it's unfair, I know. I'm focusing very uh, regional uh, teaching of Gongzi. But that's how I understood. No, I want all the work, my work, horizontal. You know, box forms, they don't go on the wall. They are here, very intimate kind of a book. Or my mom uh, embroidered small flowers on hankies. So hankies are wrapped uh, uh, lunch boxes. Maybe you know those lunch boxes. And then that's the love. And that's the love that I want to share. But. How I interpret Confucianism might be different. Maybe its male perspective would be different from that of women's. And here, I'm a woman, but I'm strong. I can do whatever I want. And that's the power of the country. So we're blessed. We know um, great uh, cultural uh, size of both East and West. Is, you know, specifically Korea and America here. I think, you know, there's a little bit of misunderstanding <laughs> about, you know, <laughs> Confucianism actually, you know. I think, you know, in my opinion, it's my opinion, but uh, uh, the, the relationship, what we have, you know, they probably you know, vertical a little bit, but, uh, you know, based on good relationship, I think, right? Good. Yeah, good relationship. I mean, as you said, you know, it's, uh, there's a hierarchy and, uh, you know, f it's sometimes it's a forceful. But uh, what I'm thinking about, you know, the really good Confucian, you know, uh, idea is uh, based on really good relationship, which is, you know, there's a hierarchy, but uh, we respect, you know, uh, wives, you know. If, oh, if it's a scholar, right. yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a good, good, good relationship. I mean, Confucianism, I think, you know, reality, there is something going wrong and uh, misused, you know, maybe that's uh, true. But uh, what Gong Zhu say, you know, that's a real, you know, Confucianism is a relationship, what they're talking about, even, you know, a king and, you know, someone's, you know, to have a relationship or teachers and, you know, students have a relationship, but the relationship, you know, both way respect each other somehow. I think, you know, so honestly, I, I, that's what I learned over here more than Korea, honestly. You know, when I had, uh, you know, uh, many good, you know, teachers, even, you know, in Korea and here. But uh, what I really learned about, you know, good relationship is, you know, to, to respect each other. I mean, you know, Tony is my first you know, American teacher, and uh, that's what I learned. I mean, as a, the relationship I 
build with him. Uh, it was kind of strange, you know, every, every week. We met every week, you know, when I was a graduate student in Long Beach. And I prepared whole weeks, you know, for the meeting, actually. And to me, it's kind of, you know, really very religious, you know, kind of meeting, <laughs> like a confession time. <laughs> you know, I go there, yeah. I'm, I prepare, then I go there, and I work hard in a whole, you know, week or two. Then when we have a meeting, I confess, you know. Be really honestly, you know. Then uh, and Tony respect that and you know give a real good feedback to me. I think you know, which I really respect that. And I'm trying to give same kind of respect to my students too, right? So here's a role model, you know. And uh, I'm still carry on, you know, this good relationship with him, uh, based on that, you know. I I think you know. It's not easy, but uh, I still do. I still try. Then, for example, you know, this uh, panel, suppose, you know, we can do it. I mean, three weeks ago, uh, the moderator from Korea, Haeyong, can come, and, you know, various reasons. Then what I can think about it, you know, if Tony can be a moderator, then we can carry on this, you know, panel. So I called him, and uh, he said yes, somehow. Right? Then uh, what I makes I had it no happen? Choice. <laughs> 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 no choice. But, uh, you know, to based on real good relationship as a teacher, I can ask him, yeah. you know, uh, very humbly. Then, you know, on, it's, it's my honor. If I trust him, you know, he understands so many, you know, things uh, very deeply about Korean artists and uh, Korean philosophy. Also, so if he can be a moderator, that's going to be a really good one. I, I trust that, you know. So that's what I ask about it, and what we doing now actually. So I don't know, Jawan. I mean, you know, personally, uh, I believe you know that's the good relationship. The Confucian is you know trying to make that happen in the world. <laughs> then you know, reality, you know, it doesn't happen probably. Many cases, in many cases. Sorry. Um, we are starting to run down on time for this panel, and, and, and what I'd like to do is to have me stop asking questions and to open it up to the audience. If you have questions, there's a mic right in the middle there. So if you stand up and address the mic, please. Hi. Oh. Sorry. Hi. Um, okay, so this whole uh, East and West thing, <laughs> if I think about it too much, it's sort of like when you think about your breathing too much and then you just can't breathe anymore. Um, and I was just wondering how how often you actually think about like Korea versus America in your work? Because I'm a Canadian-born Korean, and I'm not not Korean, but every time I do like specifically Korean stuff, it sort of feels like I'm doing a bad play about people pretending to be Korean, but I am Korean. And it's just like, because the first question that was asked was, um, how do you navigate between uh, historical Korean culture and Western contemporary culture, um, but it just like I can't imagine myself like thinking about both worlds. But I was definitely raised Korean, so it's just very confusing for me. Yeah. L well, let me say something about that. I, maybe the difference is you, you were raised in a Korean household, but born in Canada, and everyone on the on the panel here was born in Korea and went through the Korean school system and then came here. You know, kind of fully Korean entering into uh, American culture and, and then the university system here, more or less. And so that's probably the, that's why the question was conformed that way. Uh, it may not apply to you really. Maybe there's a better question for you, you know, to think about. But um, is, is, there, is there a way for you to succinctly ask that question again um, to, to one of the particular panel members that you, if you'd like? Just wanted to say, that. okay. All right, thank you, next. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm kind of um, like her in that um, I come from the other perspective. And um, I was American born, born in Everett, uh, Washington. But uh, my first experience with, with clay was in Korea uh, back in 1988. And I ended up studying there uh, back in 1990. And um, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, you, you talk about the freedom that we have in America versus the tradition there. And everyone wanted me to make hangari, right? <laughs> or korea <laughs> or, um, 
but my teacher um, said to me something very interesting, which was, my work is very American, but there's something that's really very Korean about it. And um, one of my best friends describes me as being that awkward, like, combination of 100% ancient Korean and 100% whitewashed. <laughs> but um, one thing that I really took to heart is um, she said that my work had the Korean sadness, that spirit of Han, which is so much a part of Korean culture. It pervades everything. And I, I would just wonder <coughs> if you feel that sense of the Korean sadness when you, when you create your work. Are you addressing that to Jaewon in particular, or anybody? Anyone. Okay. Well, you know, um, all these topics, uh, transcultural experience, East meets West, hybridization of your process, all such cliche. I'm really tired of talking about it, but that's the, the main kind of focus because I'm not Korean, I'm not American. I cannot say like Hun did, I'm not Korean. I'm not Korean anymore. But when I uh, spend time with Korean uh, friends in Korea, I say, you know what? I feel I am more Korean than you guys are, and they agree. So there is that, uh, that uh, deep root still embedded in me. And I don't want to hear other uh, uh, Korean American artists talk. Basically, we have the uh, same um, threads as concepts. But you, you are right, the word Han, that's really hard to uh, translate into English. Some kind of a sentiment, sorrowfulness, sadness. But historically, you know, I mentioned a little bit, Korean history is really a sad uh, history and country has gone through so much. So I deal with it. As a uh, woman, I saw so many sadness, tragic uh, events, and I carry it. But that's a great, um, stepping stone, I jump out of it. So I gain more strength, but I accept it. I live with it, I live through it. So I feel more powerful. I can't hit somebody. I am too strong sometimes because, because I, I embrace that kind of a sorrow. You know, my mother so, uh, uh, had so much sorrow and her mother and a lot of women in history, but look, look, look at us, that's, you know, the string board to create more strength, to move on, to go on. The sorrow that transcendence somehow, mm -hmm. right? You know, so yeah. it's not just, you know, sorrow, but uh, it's somehow, you know, I, that's what I'm thinking, yeah. But can but I say one thing though? Like, I don't know about your teacher, the Korean teacher actually, whether you had that in your work or she saw that from your work. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so it doesn't matter how you did it. If she, because she's Korean, because she's thinking about her background, her history, her feelings, that's what she sees, not because of you has Korean blood. Nothing to do with that, I don't think. You know, just my personal opinion, you know what I mean? Yeah, so how the people actually contextualizing those kind of things in with their thing, you know? Yeah, it's nothing. Okay, what if, what if I did it as 100% Korean? You know, my nationality is in Korea. I'm not gonna switch it. I don't wanna be a US citizen at this point, but hide my face and then made the exact same piece like you did, and then somebody said, they might not see that. Mm -hmm. well, we, we, it looks like sure. we have one more one question and one minute, please. <laughs> Sorry. This question is more towards uh, Hundi. Yeah. Um, when did you realize that you had this spark when you were in Korea that you wanted to make work that was really different than the craftsmanship? Yeah. Where'd you get the permission to do that? You know what I'm saying? Like, where'd you get that inner strength to just keep going forward and not care? Well, at that time, actually, the only one reason was I was like, what, middle of 20s, and then I was young enough at the time. So I'm trying to go anything against to what we had, okay. you know, the, against the tradition, do you know what I mean? My old school is a pretty, like a formal practi practice you have to go through, being a potter, sitting on the wheels and throwing, throwing, throwing. Why do I have to do this? You know, is there anything, something new? That time was like late 80s and early 90s. Big thing mm. was at that time in Korea was, yeah, so, like, yeah. yeah, so postmodernism, deconstruction, you know, conceptual art, Joseph Hoy's coming in, all those things. As a young student, 
I was into those kind of a contemporary stuff a lot, you know, obviously, you know. And then some reason is I don't want to do that kind of like thousand cup making homework, you know. I want to do some kind of something <laughs> different. <laughs> uh, really quickly, one more. Your mother. You yes. never show your mother your work, and I'm thinking of all of your mothers. You know well, what I mean? Just yeah, sure. But that doesn't mean I have to show. Why do I have to show? If I believe that, why do I have to show that? No, show to her. No, that's what I'm saying. So I don't, I don't believe that I have to show my work to my mother. Uh -huh. If this is a true my thing, does it make sense? To honor her? No. <laughs> no? No. no I, don't, I don't know. She doesn't know. Okay, yeah. everyone. <laughs> thank, thank you. So, thank you, Elsa. Thank you. thank you so much, everyone. I'm, I hope one hour is not enough time, obviously, and uh, each of these artists is so powerful. And, but I hope that gives you a little bit of insight and understanding um, about them as artists and their experience here in the States, having come from Korea. Thank you very much. <laughs>